ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm ladies, waiting for you to finish a syllable. That's why I'm looking at ladies you. Ladies and like gentlemen, that. welcome to the latest episode of the Carmudgeon Show. That is Larry Webster. Do you know who Larry Webster is? I do, yes. He's your how many is bosses, 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 boss? Jason has six bosses. I have six bosses, maybe you seven. You ain't the boss of me. You the boss of my <laughs> bosses. Anyway, but Larry is a storied automotive journalist having a long, long, long Very career. Long. Yeah, he's old. Um you got your start at Car and Driver 146 years ago. 1995. 1995, when Derek was a mere 75 years old. Uh, and you then ran testing for Car and Driver, and then you left and you became editor-in-chief of Road and Track. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you ran screaming from there or left silently, and now are at Haggerty running all of media. Yeah, we're having a lot of fun. So grateful you guys are with us. Whenever anyone says we're having a lot of fun, that means they're corporate. This is why he gets paid real money, and I just <laughs> fuck around with cars. Um, Jason, you know my greatest my greatest strength is I'm palatable to upper management. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you should get that as a bumper sticker. <laughs> my greatest strength is I'm palatable to upper management. <laughs> And this is why you were able to come up with the Haggerty Bull Market, <laughs> which we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the cars that made it onto the 2024 Haggerty Bull Market. Uh, Larry, are you are going to entertain us? We're going to fight about Ferraris. Anything else we're going to do? We're going to play yeah, some Yeah, man, guessing. we're going to show you how much fun you can have for not a lot of money. I mean, these cars are store of values, and we've been doing this every year. To, I mean, you're, you'll talk about it, but it's just a way to really help people engage and, and enter the hobby. Because the more people that are in it, the better it is for all of us. And or potentially we... make any money or at least break even as such that you can have some joy without, um, I don't know, losing your shirt. Okay. I have a prediction of two other things that are going to happen on this episode. Okay. The first one is I'm going to spill my glass of water and you guys are all going to clean it up while I just <laughs> laugh. You're going to get to see Jake. And well, He's Jake, a real Jake character. Jake will probably be yeah, in be cleaning on, up on with camera. paper towel. And the other thing that's going to happen is I'm going to tell you that if you like this content and want to support it, can please consider joining the Haggerty Drivers Club, which gets you unlimited access to our valuation tools, which are very important to this episode. Unlimited flatbed toes 24-7 for your classic cars. Uh, you get the magazine that he runs that he writes a column in and he just wrote something nice about me last month for furthermore the, first time. the bull market is published in that same magazine that's true uh, highly so curated highly sweated over product that you get six times a year and uh that's we PTSD. hope it harkens back to when a lot of us started our automotive enthusiasm by reading car magazines so yeah you can do all that at the link below otherwise now we're going to wait for larry to clap this episode derek derek clapton over here has got a hard time clapping so larry for the audio sync you get to do it Totally did not hear that. I did you hear that? I didn't hear it either. Didn't come, your Zoom filtered it out. The, the, That's amazing. The, the, he's worse at clapping. He's high. worse. Uh, oh, we found it. Didn't work? No, no, it didn't it work. It literally I filtered it, it out. It. I okay. think it clipped it because it thought it was an extraneous That's noise. funny. I'll do it. Damn. I didn't hear it. That's oh, so weird. Interesting. So it's Zoom. Okay, okay, now you're just making life hard for Jake. Anyway, buckle up. Enjoy this episode of the Carmudgeon Jingle. This episode of The Carmudgeon Show is brought to you by the Valentine One Radar Locator. Find radar before it finds you. Get more information at bit.ly slash valentine1 underscore Haggerty. That's https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly slash capital V-A-L-E-N-T-I-N-U number one underscore capital H A G E R T Y. Ladies and gentlemen, on that television screen right over there is Larry Webster, who is my boss's 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 boss. And we have to be nice to him, Derek. Uh, that should <laughs> what be is fine that ever for happened? me. Come That's on. <laughs> never happened before, and it's not going to fucking start right now. The best yeah, thing, excellent, excellent. the best thing is that we have all shared some sort of STD. You people are gross to me. Um, oh, you the dinosaurus! Had, you had a three hundred eight GT four uh -huh. that I drove, and then because I drove it, I had to buy it, uh -huh. and then Larry drove it, and then he had to buy a three hundred eight GT four. That and I can spill my true. water. Yeah, impressive. <laughs> uh, that means it's contagious. Um, yeah, that car super impressed me. Um, sorry, Larry, if you can't so see it, funny. I just dumped like a half a gallon of water all over the table, and Jake is like, oh, okay. basically knocking down. Were we down recording the that? No. Oh yeah, we're not. Oh yeah, and we'll keep no, it. We this were. is in the episode. Oh shit! I was pouring water. Here, Derek, you have some. <laughs> well, I don't. 
Mm-hmm. Larry, <clears throat> I know you pay Larry, us a lot I'm of money. Good thing you're not in the I studio, should, Larry, or actually, you'd be getting it on your head. Well, Derek, like, I should kind of hate you because I'm in the middle of this restoration that is <gasps> oh, a freaking nightmare. Yeah. Of nightmare. That bad. Well, you could have uh, yes. bought a, a 246 and had a substantially similar experience for more money. Then you could hate me more. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the, the state of getting work done on your car like a paint job is a disaster. Oh, you're I mean, getting it's it painted? Like body shop jail. See, oh, what it is. Jason and I just left ours rusty. That's the real yeah. strong word. I really didn't it's have rust adjacent. I had to fix it. What color is it? Thank you. It was originally um, a light blue. And uh, the story I heard is they didn't sell, so they painted it black. And they put the Ferrari badges on it because it's a 1975. Ah, and, early uh, car. And I'm going I'm to paint it blue Sarah. Oh, that's a nice Beautiful color. color. Yeah. It's beautiful color, um, but it's such a fun car to drive. I mean, uh, you. So wait, Jay. Let me get this straight. You bought Derek's car? Yes. Yeah. Derek showed up at my house for a party, and I'm like, "Why what the fuck are you doing in that ugly white Ferrari?" And he ha- literally <laughs> just did this: handed me the keys, and 1.3 miles later, I said, "I'll take it." He's like, "What? Well, I just, I, I, yeah. just, I just got it." I'm like, "Well, when you're done with it, I'll take it. I want it." And I, it was three and a half years later. Yeah, um, I sold it to you. I bought that exchange happened on the 28th of February, 2016. I bought the car on September 11th or 10th of 2015. And then I sold it to you in June of 2018. I'm glad you keep track of this because I don't, I have no idea when it well, was. Uh, here, I know you have a theory on this, Jay. Maybe you could share it with me. There's so much nicer to drive than the Magnum PI 308s. That's what Derek said and to me. And- I don't understand it. I mean, even if you have a clo- you know, the fixed roof 308s, the Targas are all flexy but i mean i've driven a bunch of those cars and i never was that impressed with the 308s and then i drove the gt4 and was like oh wow this is pretty fantastic up that road to your house where you could really lean on it and it was predictable and fun and lively and light and all that great stuff i theory at the well at the risk of offending everyone or a lot of people i hate the 308 gtb and gts i I, i've only driven three of them and i've hated Mm -hmm. them all um we've said this on the podcast before they they're terrible to drive and it, there's two things. Number but why one, are they different then? The, you know, the, the GT4 is the early one, the first right. gen, right? But the Longer G- wheelbase? The GT4 is the same chassis as the 246, 246 Dino. Um, so it's all of that magic. And that all changed for the 308 GTB. So really? I think it's a combination, personally, I think what it is, because it's all it's effectively the same suspension and steering that wound up in the 308 GTB, the Pininfarina cars. But I think the difference is wheel travel, in the 308 so it can be soft and pliable um, and not mm-hmm. bottom out everywhere and yeah. the driving position and the carbs so this is why i want to ask you derek you've driven a carbureted 308 gtb yes and it's okay it's not as good it's better why it's i don't not- know why they're so different to drive hmm. i would love to know the answer to that but what is it is it the the fact that you're miserably uncomfortable in the gtb or is it just doesn't sound as good like what does it sound like it sounds similar hmm yeah. Okay. I mean, the steering yeah, wheel. A lot of mechanical clatter. It's not the, the Ferrari shriek you're hoping for, right? No, it's the, I mean, it, in the injected ones, they're miserable. I mean, the answer there is yeah. definitely CIS, but even the carbureted GTBs are like, I don't know. I drove one once and I was like, it's it's better. It's better than the fuel. It is better. Job. Yeah. The, the driving is, position is weird. You have a smaller, it seems like a smaller steering wheel. You get less leverage. And I agree that it doesn't ride as softly. Yeah. So I don't know. And then the other thing was the gear ratios are really long. Mm-hmm. So they're stupid short. Gear ratios on our 308 oh, GT4s are like a Miata. And I mean, there's in the 50, US cars. In the US, even Europe. Mm. They were still pretty short. And then the GTBs were really long legged, probably for fuel economy emissions or something. For sure. Yep. 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 Um, well, yeah. I mean, our, you know, if mine is ever done, then our next task, as we've talked about, is making it sound like a flat plane V8. Yeah. I mean, I still, it's a head scratcher. It's, I mean, the reason it sounds like two four cylinders is because it's running like two four cylinders. I mean, they're totally, each side of the engine is completely independent and exhaust and they have what should be equal length headers, but then vastly different exhaust. uh, After the 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 four into one happens. So Mm -hmm. the trick is we need to have somebody fab up a true equal length from the valve to the tip um, exhaust setup and see if it does the, the, it should, it should get sweeter. It should sound like the um, 355s instead of i can't wait 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been Seth. asking everybody I know who who uh, bakes exhaust. I was like, we got a project for you. Yeah. I'll be the guinea pig because yeah. well, I'll come. Yeah, I mean, because they rent the seventy five hundred. The thing's how seventy seven. Yeah, they yeah, have, but it just doesn't sound like that much. I I love the way it sounds. It sounds like the world's most complicated four cylinder. Yeah, but. I mean, I like the being in the car for sure. You just it's the intake and Weber's that really give the best noises. Am I yelling at you too much? No, I turned up the volume when we were doing the test earlier, and now I can't. So is that with the stock airbox? Yes. Because that thing seems like it's quite a little muffling chamber. I was always wondering, nobody seems to make uh, like a, you know, just a foam filter you could fit up top. I, I see people do, do those. I feel like yeah. mine has a K and N in the, you know, it's, it's a big square filter yeah. box. And I feel like it has a K and N in there. Um, the car did have, our car came with when you got it, had a set of four pancake, like, pancake type. types. And I never drove it on it. I never drove it. Like There's that so much either. intake noise on it that I can't imagine. Yeah, it, would get it already has a lot of intake noise. Mm. Anyway, that is unless this car is on the Haggerty Bull Market list of this year, this is neither here nor there, right? Because has it ever been on the Haggerty Bull Market? List? <laughs> we mean, could make the, some the, fucking money, dude. It's so mixed that car, right? <laughs> I mean, you see them for sale for fifty grand in what we might call number three or number four condition, which is you know a little bit rough, and they struggle to get fifty grand. And then you guys probably saw that really, really well done restored one for well over a hundred. So yeah, there's sort of a couple all of them have been in the one forties. What are the what are the beautiful one? Jeff's uh, car, Ed's and Jeff's car. No, no, no. The one from um, oh, the blue one. The well, blue that was one. the first one built. Yeah. What did that go for? Uh, it Half went like million? yeah, I think it went for four or five hundred thousand. My the, theory on that on the GT4 is that if you get a Euro look car, so if you have Euro bumpers and a, and a pre catalyst us like you know us car you will get good money out of it if it's a us bumpered car it's so fucking ugly god i'm gonna offend everyone that no one wants yeah it. but the the dark red one that is local in this area the whole its whole life that car has us trim and it's sold for a buck 40 or buck 47 really? or something like that yeah Jesus. it's just condition i mean because these cars are so expensive to put right Mm. Um, as larry's learning <laughs> look, yeah. look at that face <laughs> <laughs> he's like uh, twitching over thanks there. for reminding me Jeff. i mean i was like i bought it for 25 grand i'm like how bad could it be well well, well but hold on but your car is a euro car so you know it's yeah, got all it? the compression all mm. the all the motor it's got 75 it's beautiful but it's got the little bumpers it's mm -hmm. got little tiny lights on the corners right yep yep yeah it's, instead it's, of the reflectors instead yeah. of the big reflectors it's going to be stunning yeah You'll, you'll, and fingers crossed if it ever, if it ever leaves the garage. Listen, how many Ferraris have you owned? One. How many Ferraris have I owned? One. How many Ferraris are, are you willing to put this much shit into? Uh, yeah, this is my second Ferrari. And, uh, I, I there's just something about that shape. It's so controversial, but I, I've always thought they were just gorgeous. I, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, it, I hated Italian them forever. Spree. I hated them oh, forever. Really? And then I drove this one and then I was like, well, I guess I have to buy it because it drives so well. Yeah. I mean, I hated it when you pulled up in it. The more I look at it, the prettier it gets because yes. you don't. You it's start an to notice the subtlety. Taste. But no, but you driving. Guys know Lu Luigi Cinetti, right? Of course. Yeah, the guy who uh, started really gave Ferrari the beachhead here in America, and, and won Le Mans son. for the first time ever for Ferrari in 1949. Yeah. He was the first ever. Yeah, amazing. And did he drive like 23 out of 24 hours? He did. Car, I, think I think it was 23 and a half out of 24 yeah. hours in 1949 at Le Mans. And he, this is before cocaine them. was like really a thing. Well, I mean, think about World War II and the Nazis. They definitely had some they performance had something enhancing, enhancing, yeah. enhancing <laughs> substances. Uh, well, his son was heavily involved with the dealership, and I asked him, Luigi Jr., and uh, I was talking about something else, and I, I had already bought the car, and I asked him, I said, hey, when the GT4 came out, what, what did you guys think? And he just, he groaned. He oh, went, yeah. Oh, that car. As soon as we saw it. I, we went back to the U.S. We said, it's time to sell the dealership. We started making plans to get rid of it. That's we awesome. just thought that was the end. <laughs> and listen, it wasn't really until I was deep into the research and reading all the period road tests of the 308 GT4 and 246 Dino together. And I think what the real reason what happened is, you know, if you think about the Ferraris that are sold in America, you have this 246 Dino. Everyone knew it as the mm -hmm. Dino. And it's mm -hmm. followed up by a complete change of everything. Right, it wasn't yeah, a successor. It was a completely different car that were yeah. that really should have been together in the dealerships at the same time to complement each other, and mm. to replace that what looks like little curvaceous sporty nugget mm -hmm. of deliciousness with this awkwardly proportioned wedge shaped 
craziness. Four seat car. And yeah. call it the same thing. That was the fuck up. I think if they said, well, we have the 246 Dino and then we have the 308 Dino and you can have like pretty or ugly or, you know, curvy this or brutalist. This is in z- exactly what happened incidentally in 1980 when the Mondial came out. And yeah. then they were like, you can have either, you yeah. can have them both. And that, I think that was the fuck up. Because if you think about what, at the time, they're like, how the fuck are we going to sell this thing when we've been selling that? Um, I think if they'd have called to it something To be fair, different. they were available simultaneously for some years also, right? You could get the, the Vetro Resina, the Pininfarina car came out in 1976. So for four years, you could get either car. You could get a oh, 308 GTB oh, or a GT4. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. That's true. But but the Dino, at that point, the damage had been done, right? Because people yes. associated Dino with the 246. Yes. I just think it's it was a marketing fuck up. Had they called it something different, no one cared that the 365 GTC 4, whatever it was, the weird, awkward, squared off looking one. The Rolls Royce Camargue looking one? Yes, that's yes. the one. No one cared that that one was, uh, was wedgy because it wasn't replacing something that was curvaceous and sexy. Yes, it was. It was doing exactly that. It was replacing the 365 GTC 4. Although not in the U.S. because that car was never available Fair in the U.S. Okay. But it was the four-seat for Anyway, this is not the subject of today's but, podcast. But it's apparently become it. Get that 308 yeah, okay, GT4 on the bull market though, list. I mean, <laughs> uh, Got to just go back to the GT4. It's a, you know, yeah. I love that, that car. But you know, when they when the GT4 came out, it was their first V8. Yeah. Right. Yep. It had rear seats, so sensibly a more usable package. I mean, I think the name means something, but I also think just the looks was just. They were all, weird. They were too weird. Yes, I mean it was, it was the only Bertone designed Ferrari right. since the I mean f- catalog Ferrari since the early fifties. Look at the design of every Ferrari produced, starting from the from the early nineteen sixties and uh, until the two thousands, and the one aberration on that on that graph paper of all those designs would be the GT four. I mean, it was the weirdest looking. It was the one that looked the least like a Ferrari. Yes. Um, I agree I, with that. I, you know, people th- thought it was ugly, but I think they thought it was probably ugly for a Ferrari and unacceptable mm-hmm. looking for a Ferrari. It's cool looking, mm-hmm. but it doesn't look like a Ferrari. And that yes. was, I think, the problem. Um, just like, I mean, and Puro Sangue now doesn't look like a Ferrari, right? It's, but that's, I guess it does. It's, it's still an extension. But it has it's, a V12. Yeah. And it has Ferrari design language mm-hmm. applied to a not Ferrari shape, shape, as yeah. opposed to this, which you could argue is like a Ferrari-ish shape with not Ferrari design language. Although it does have round rear lights. Yeah, but that wasn't enough. I, no. Round rear lights inside. I mean, on the flip side, housing. they only made, what, 1,700-ish, the GT4s, right? 27, I thought it was. So, 2,700. 2,700? Yeah. Okay. But it's so it's relatively rare compared to the GTB and GTSs. Yes, and it's worth a lot less. So for somebody like a bottom troller like me, or me wins, or me. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we. By all the way, Derek wants to common. keep changing the subject because he's the only person in this group who doesn't currently own a GT4, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he doesn't want. And he's mad that he sold his to me and doesn't want well, anyone to know. Derek, give me know. another year. If I still have a pile of parts, I'll call you. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's got first right of refusal on the white one. Um, but oh, okay. uh, that I sad to say that's Yeah, but blue is better than white. Blue Eurocar? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Blue Eurocar. Yeah. That's the dream. I would, I would sell my no, I wouldn't. I'm fine with the white. Jizz white, way to go. Um okay, now that we have to we're professional again. Mm-hmm. Um Larry, you came here to discuss Haggerty's bull market, which is a once a year festival of finance. Mm-hmm. Talk to us. Finance, but really opportunity, Jay, is the way I like to say it. Okay. okay. Opportunity in that these are cars. This is our seventh edition. These are the cars that we think are going to appreciate. And we don't mean in like great leaps and bounds, but just enough so that you can buy it, enjoy it, and sell the car later with about what you had in it, or maybe a little more, which just shows the cost of ownership, the cost to, to enjoy this hobby is really remarkably cheap at this period of time and that's what we're trying to you know create what they call that on-ramp to the hobby just you know give people a reason to dream and to sort of help them make good decisions and justify a decision that might otherwise be justifiable people i feel like right it's a bad decision often confuse purchase price with total cost of ownership and i think i don't operate in terms of purchase price uh, right. So much as total cost of ownership, a fifteen thousand dollar Corolla is not a huge investment. I mean, it's fifteen thousand bucks, but it's still not a huge investment. The problem is that fifteen thousand dollar investment will be worth zero in five years. I'm obviously yeah. making these numbers up. There are other places you could stash fifteen thousand dollars that won't be worth zero in five years. That could be worth fifteen or could be worth fifty. And so when I look at 
cars and my personal financials, I'm looking at my cars as another 401k. And I'd rather drive my 401k, you know. even if it drops 20% in value. If, you know, if I get a bank statement and my 401k drops 20, 20%, so I've lost $20, um, I'm going to be pissed off at that 20 bucks. If I'm doing burnouts in my 401k and enjoying it and power sliding around a corner, who gives a fuck if it's worth 20% less? Um, I get it. it. It's a store of value that you enjoy. Yeah. Um, that's Absolutely. why I like this, the bull market thing, because you, you know, I think you should go into the, uh, methodology. methodology. I'm very interested to hear how the yeah. sausage is made. Okay. Well, take it away. Do you want me to start there? Yes, please. Yeah. I'm not okay, involved. Well, for the uh, record, I'm not involved in the process at all. I find, I, I actually don't even know what's on the list. Yeah. Neither do year. I. So we're all going to find out at the same time. And make viewers fun of good. You can, you, you can agree. This started, uh, seven years ago. First when I got to Haggerty and, um, I learned about the valuation team and there was, I didn't realize how big it was. You know, they had Haggerty has the price guide and they print it. They have it online. You can go get the sort of relative value of a lot of really interesting cars to help you make decisions. And I didn't understand how much data that they look at to come up with those prices. It's not just past historical data. It's just how many calls they're getting on certain cars, how many they're reported are selling. They're tracking private sales. They're talking to dealers. It's a much richer picture than I thought. And I don't know. I had this idea. I was like, well, this is a lagging indicator, right? The data is lagging. And I called up Brian Rabel who heads it up with this kind of, uh, I thought was a crazy question. I, I, I thought I knew the answer. I said, hey, do you think, you know, we could make a list of cars that are going to appreciate? Like, that's what really people want to know. It's going to be worth more tomorrow. And there's like this pause and he goes, yeah, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> I was like, well, why are we doing it? Let's do it. And that's, that's how we started the first list. And what they do, there's now 15 people in the in the data analytics department, and they look at all that stuff I was talking about. It's um, not just past auction sales, but past sales. They look at the people calling in, and not just that they're calling, but their ages, because usually they call in for a quote. So you know how old they are. So if they start seeing a pickup in interest in Gen Xers, they start, they think like, oh, okay, this generation is really excited for this car. They added things like uh, the number of cars imported and exported. Hmm. Because if they're being exported, that suggests a higher global demand. And if they're being imported at a higher number, that suggests that there's more demand but not enough supply. So they, they use that in conjunction with their years of experience, plus they, they have a board of professionals that they call and they gut check stuff. And you know Dave Kinney's on it. He's been doing this for, what, hundred years, right? Two hundred. And so that kind of informs their their total list. If you and we get a bigger list, we get like twenty cars. And you know, some of them are so obvious that we see on the list that I, I say like we can't do that. Like you guys know the the Nissan Pulsar. It's uh <laughs> yes, the JDM, that back? Japanese Oh okay. Yeah, that little square back thing, mm-hmm. right? Of course, that's going to go in value. But I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, there's like five of them in the country. I mean, how is anybody going to buy one of that stuff? Because the whole point of this, like you said, was to uh, help people attain uh, a fun car. So we didn't want stuff that was too esoteric. And so we try and have a really broad cross section of cars at different price points and age ranges. So So is there a magic number of cars you're looking for in total? Like 10? uh, Yeah. Yeah, around 10, around 10, you know, because we, we, we want to shoot them and, and show them properly. So we usually have like 10 or 12 and then a couple may drop out because, you know, something happened right before the shoot or whatever. So that's right around where, where we where we uh, end up is around 10. We tried having some motorcycles on there. Last year we had that um, that Harley, which is really neat. But this year we said, hey, we're not going to do the motorcycle. So it's a moving target and it's always evolving. But um, does that roughly answer your question derek i mean it's probably not the detail you want but that's probably about the best i can give you yeah um basically it's a bunch of factors that all come together and it's based though fundamentally on data which i think is cool because there's obviously access from insurance to data and from the marketplace uh that and it can all get aggregated in in one place in a way that uh the average consumer doesn't have the interest or ability to do to me the yeah. the most interesting thing when i got a presentation from the valuation guys a year ago or so was the age related yes. factors yeah right? right i mean they know if you know they can see they'll chart out interest levels um in terms of different age groups and you can watch the cars peak as everyone has you know it's 50 years old or whatever yeah um, uh, and that's really interesting but that's a, a very different indicator of 
a bunch of 90 year olds are looking at insuring 300 SL gold wings like you, um, if you could, I versus, would be looking at insuring exactly. my gold wing if I had one. Yes. I mean, like I'd, you know, love to see how many, okay, well, how many Honda beats does Haggerty insure in the U S and look at the, you know, export import ratios on that. I mean, it's such a wild data set to have. Access yeah. And every to. year before car week at Monterey, there's a sort of uh, industry get together because everybody's all in the same place at the same time, all the sort of dealers who are, are movers and shakers, yeah. and they all have this dinner. And I think one of the most interesting things that comes out of that is the average age of the lots that are going through, uh, mm-hmm. that year, because, you know, I think last year it was 1964 and this year it was 1964. Uh, so, it, so what you're learning is that the, the, the younger demographic is trading cars in a place other than Monterey and may not even be using the in-person auctions, mm-hmm. but will be using other platforms and seeing the emergence and the changes in buying trends to me is very interesting as someone who is actively in the industry. Wasn't one of the figures that they gave us, Larry, that, um, uh, was it like 80% of all, uh, collector car transactions are private. Was it something oh, like that? Oh, at least. It yeah. was like, you know, we tend to think of like these, yeah. you know, the big auction houses as the repository yeah. for information, but it's all the private sale stuff. And of course, then we yes. know what people, if people come and get a policy. That, and that, Haggerty has access to that information in a way that the public doesn't. doesn't and that's yeah. why I think it's yeah, particularly it's the iceberg. Coupled with uh, age information. Right. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, uh, one of the cars, I'll, I'll get right into it, that... Um, the first one on our list this probably won't be too surprising but one of the nine out of ten people that call us for a quote about this car are gen x or younger so to speak about that data point the, the quote volumes rising that we see the price rising a little bit and then the age of the people that are calling about it is uh you should make us guess. as well and this car uh, i'm so curious to hear your take on this one it's the e92 m3 yes 2007 to 2013 yep makes and, a ton of sense uh, yeah i didn't think that would surprise you did it does it no no not at all i mean because it's as bmw drifts farther and farther astray then this car starts to look better and better and it has i think the the, the centerpiece of that car is the engine it's this naturally yeah, yeah. aspirated you know car where you feel like okay it's time to shift and you look down and you're like oh just kidding there's 1500 more rpm to go before it's time to shift there's just this magic old school bmw-ness to it like great chassis great engine just all of the ingredients of a really desirable car and available with a manual transmission, but also has an automatic that doesn't suck, unlike the generation prior, the E46. So, yeah, to me, that makes a ton of sense. That's something I would preach as long as you're okay with the, you know, pitfalls of owning car those cars, which is mm-hmm. the bottom ends needing refreshing, which is a normal BMW M engine thing. But, yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. And they all got used up and fuckboys drove them and modified them into the ground. And so finding a good one, especially with not a million miles, uh, is tough. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's a, it's such a no brainer. It's the best M5 ever made. I mean, they put an M3 badge on it, but that it was <laughs> totally a, you know, exactly what it is. It, it's you huge. say that because it got too big and fat, right? Well, it got big and fat, but it, you know, look, re, from my perspective, M was motorsport and, you know, M, the M3 lineage be, it started from a DTM homologation car and it was always one step away from a race car. Whereas, yeah. M5s were always executive sedans that did everything better than everybody else. And what the E90 M3 did, and I'll call it E90. Did more not E92. things better than everyone else. Fair enough. Um, you know, an E90 M3 four-door, for example, is the size of an E39 M5. Uh, on the inside, it's actually bigger. Um, but it does, it's a, a high-speed cruiser and a fun drift car and a beautiful luxury car and, 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 and it just does everything. Car, yeah. uh, brilliant steering. The E90? Act, the E90, yeah. You know, it's interesting, and it just refreshed my memory. That was the first one that got the straight six, 333 horsepower. No, no, no we're still talking about the E92. E92 and e, so E92 is the coupe, E90 is the sedan. So we're talking about the same car. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I think I'm thinking of E46, E46 yeah. the previous generation. Yes. Yeah, F- yes. E46, I think, was peak M3. Um, no. You do? Well, no, why? I'm an E36 I was M3. Say, to me, E36 M3 Yeah, he's is, got one. Stop kissing his ass. Oh, really? He's got the one, that silver one Wait, that I did. I, thought, oh, I remember on. the silver car, yes. I thought the E36 really was the first one. That, the E36 was in the 90s. Was a, it was the yeah. second one after the E30. Yeah. I thought it lost its motorsportsness. Like, yeah, because in the U.S. Different. they put that sort of rubbish engine, but the fact of the matter, it's not even a rubbish engine. It's just not as exciting. No, no, he's saying he division. lost it when, with the E46 is what you're saying, Larry, right? You're saying- I thought the E46 was like, it was an undeveloped car. It had all the ingredients, but it didn't have that BMW integration that you so love. I thought the rear suspension, for example, wasn't in wasn't in tune with the front. Huh. I always felt it was it was hopping over places, and it was just like 
it traded stiffness for compliance I in the guise of handling that didn't really deliver. To me, there is like a just, and I don't have the vocabulary to articulate it specifically, but the E40, the E36 to me feels right, and the E46, it doesn't. So my right. problem is I've driven E46 exactly. comp. And so E36 was right out of the box, and that was one of the yeah. few M3s that I will say, this is a, kind of going to be a controversial statement, very few M3s have been right out of the box. E30 was right for what it did. E36 was dead right from start to finish. E46 was not. It was an understeering, rough riding exactly. thing that became- That sound like junk. That so, yeah, also, sound, they sound like drain In the US. No, nah, even in Europe, they, sound, they don't sound great. But they- Unless it's a it Cecil. Be, became great with the competition um, and the CSL. Mm -hmm. The E4, uh, the E90, I also don't think was great. That, yes, that was- Yes, when I see one of those cars, it's always a competition pack car. Compact in my head. was brilliant. The, the early, early cars, so the, the early car, I was on the launch. Did you go on the launch of that, uh, the E90? No. The, the car was terrible. It was totally terrible. Overboosted steering that was completely numb, and they went and did a mm -hmm. bunch of changes to it, even though BMW, to this day, denies they did anything. But the cars were completely different. <laughs> so we all got the original road test wrong, because we were all bitched about the cars being bad. But it was good. They were fine, but that competition was transcendent. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the reason why you feel E46s weren't great is because you're probably thinking of the original one, which it yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah. great. The first, gen, the first um, year or two, yeah. we drove it a lot. Um, but yeah, but I thought it got right in this car that's on the bull market, the uh, the 07 to 2013 mm -hmm. version, which is E90, you said, for the four-door, E92 for the two-door. And E93 and E93 for, for the, the convertible. convertible. Jinx. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man, you guys. Just E91 everything. for the wagon if they had made it, but yeah. <laughs> Nerd alert. Um, um, I, I thought this car uh, really got back to the greatness of the M3. I thought the yeah. V8 was stunning. It, and, it, you know, refs 8400. It was smooth, super powerful, tons of torque, shriek. The chassis was, was dialed in really well. The, the right size. The right yeah. feel. Perfect yeah, M5. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of M5-ish, but... I, I really it. admired last... this car. I was kind of shocked that you could get a good one these days for 55, 60 grand. I think that's quite a bargain. Man, I still that's... think of a good one as oh being God. like 37. Yeah, I didn't realize I'd gotten that expensive, but worth it. Yeah, those days are worth over it. There. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is worth it. That having been said, if you take money into account, I'd probably buy an E36. Yeah, um, yeah me too. But, um, uh, I mean, I totally understand why. And it's a genuinely swift car, right? The E36 has 240 horsepower in the US, you know, 286 if it's a three liter in Europe, a 321 for 3.2. You know, this car with 400 horsepower and 295 torque, it is genuinely swift if you beat on it mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, for someone who actually wants to go fast. No, they nailed it. Yeah, the scare of this, the bull market car, I would think, would be how those, those are complex motors. It's rod bearings. Uh, any yeah. SS code BMW engine, so any M engine always needs rod bearings. And they, yeah. they eat rod bearings 40,000 miles if, you're, if your driving style accelerates their wear. But, you know, what doesn't, what ult very high maintenance engine. Yeah, you know, what enjoyable car doesn't have some, right? Every time anyone is like, I want to buy an X. And it's like, what's it, what are the issues? You always, there's always something right. on the list. And at least it's not, well, you're driving down the road and boom, and it blows up. It's okay. You do rod bearings preventatively every, you know, 80K. Yeah. If you're, if you're not too well, on it. The, the one thing that, that, uh, I always like to think about for uh, that sort of sum of money, 50 grand is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Like, you're sort of stuck between an M3 at this generation, but also you can still get 997s for that dollar, right? 911s? Yeah, you can. And this I mean, has always been the M3's problem. Yeah, the It's always been the M3's problem. Yeah. Right? Well, and that's why to me, every M3 should have four doors. Right. Because then I it's agree. a clear functional differentiation between a 911. If you're comparing a two-door M3 to a 911, then it never works out. every time. Yeah. But if you have four doors and you're like, I'm using it for everything, or it's under the radar, or you know, I'm not a Porsche weenie because I'm driving a sedan around, then it then it makes a really Which compelling case for itself. That's because another reason it's an why M5. I don't like, <laughs> yeah, and that's the other reason why I don't like the E46 because it only came mm -hmm. as a two-door. Yeah. And I, to me, even though the original M3 was two doors also, it, sh it really should, should be a four-door four. car. Yeah. And BMW has confirmed this by calling the two-door the M4 right. in subsequent years. Look at you. Well, totally cool car. I think we're all in agreement. This is a good one. And, Absolutely. And you could certainly have a lot of fun with it. And uh, as, as we say in the article, watch the maintenance. I mean, yeah. Pretty terrifying. Now I'm going to go totally the other end of the spectrum. AMC Pacer? Uh, and 
<laughs> I kind of I wanted you, I kind of want you to make us guess. Like, give us a couple hints and see if we can get it. Oh, great idea! Great idea. Okay, talk with us. Yeah. Let's see. What can I do? This one has a really unique material for its body. Fiorolorian. Um, it um, it's convertible. It's two door. Classy. Hugely classy. Straight straight eight engine. Let me see. Eight. Oh, this is Derek's vintage. Straight it's eight. A, yeah, let me make sure it's a straight eight. Built in America during a time that was a very exuberant, exciting time 20s. to be in this country. Yeah, so this is the roaring um, 20s. Could be. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's a flathead straight eight. Had an automatic. And right. a sem it was a semi automatic. Oh, semi automatic. This is a cord. Is this a cord? That um didn't have, you know, you you you, no. you press the clutch pedal once and then you shifted without it. Yeah, yeah. This is a Wilson pre selector gearbox. And they're really a disaster. A lot of maintenance to keep <laughs> them looking pretty. It's made of wood. Uh, yes. I'm and it's not a cord. No, it can't be a cord. Not a cord. Yeah. Did Cord ever made a wood car? No, no I know. That's why that. I... Um, I have no idea. Okay, condition number two car is right now at $81,000. So not crazy expensive. I am giving up. Okay, let me do that. Okay, so 404 not about it's, it's, it's post-war. Post-World War II. Post-war. Post-war straight eight. Made of wood. With a Wilson pre-selector. Why does it have to be a Wilson? It doesn't, I guess. Nobody else made a gearbox? Kotal like did. But I think that was okay. a license of the <laughs> Wilson. How about design. the wood came from West Helena, Arkansas? What? This is an American How the car. Helena is not going to help us? <laughs> I don't know shit about American yeah. cars. Derek, is, he knows all this esoteric knowledge. Not, I thought that would be the clue that would just go, oh, yeah, I know what that is. What is it? No. No. It's a 19. 47 Chrysler Town and Country. Oh, really? GTFO. I know. I didn't know those cars had right? preselectors. I, mean, I thought they we were tend like to think that automatics. Huh. Yeah. It, it was, but you still had to use the clutch pedal. Huh. Yeah. Somewhere in between the two. Interesting. Yeah. I did not know those were preselectors. That was the thing well, that you threw might not me. call you might call it something different. It's called a fluid drive four speed. Huh. Okay. Yeah. It's a four speed. That's yeah, so that's definitely not an automatic because yeah. automatics were two speeds back then. Right. Okay, that's wild. Chrysler okay. Town and Country. I had no idea those were on the move. They are, and they. A well, part of it is that they've recently depreciated quite a bit, and so <laughs> they, they think they've, they've they've bottomed out and are back for the rise because because people look around and they're like classic this, car. Yeah, they're like, like wow, that's a lot of cars for the money. Loren. It's yeah, it's it's it it brings a lot of character. It's a convertible. It's great for parades and all that stuff. And um, so we're seeing a lot more interest in younger generations in, no in these sort of like, um, well, you it's, call them catalog cars you'd see in the Ralph Lauren catalog, perhaps. Yeah. And it yeah. solves this problem that a lot of car enthusiasts have. And it is a problem that is also solved by a car that the Mercedes 280 SE 3.5 Cabriolet, which is, I just want to cruise yeah. around with me and my SO and another couple mm -hmm. at not high speed and look really freaking cool doing it. And a 280 SE is, you know, with a three and a half liter V8, the big engine is $400,000. People often buy W124 E320 convertibles for the same reason, but it's this four place open car thing that is like iconic and Mustang cruise around. Yeah. Type of car. Original Mustang. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the guy who uh, loaned it to us, he bought it in 65 for 200 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's so cool. Yeah, and you know, it's such an interesting period to me because you know, they they were trying to shift production from from uh war supplies back mm -hmm. to cars. So they're borrowing all the pre-war designs yep. and technology and trying yep. to update it as fast as they can. Yep. Yet the public is buying anything they they put yes, in the showroom. There was so much was demand. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, here comes this car that's kind of in between the 50s and the 30s. Tons of style, tons of chrome, tons of presence. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty neat, neat cool. machine. Okay. Well, I flubbed that one. Let's try another guess uh, oh, guess with second. hints. Okay, this one we all had uh, in, on a poster on our bread bedroom or dorm wall, for sure. Except you. Um, you no, had a Peugeot I, I, 405. 
I did, but later on in college, I had that higher education poster. So oh, yeah, that okay. could be, possibly be it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, the, this is the most expensive car on the list. Already, you know, coming close to seven figures for a really nice one. Um, Countach. Would to- oh, I mean, totally fix the sound issue. Sounds amazing. Like you'd want a sports car to sound. Oh, I just gave away a hint. Um, that it's a sports let's car. Let's see. It's a what? I mean, what are those poster wall it's cars? It's three fifty five, isn't it? No, no they're not said seven, seven figures. figures. I think it's a Countach. It's yeah. a Countach. If that's yeah. what I would have thought yeah, too. Yeah. But okay, Larry, you yeah. didn't react when he said it the first yeah, time. That's a Countach. Like, yeah, as soon as you said poster, no, you said I'm it like, the first time. Countach. Well, specifically, they're talking about the twenty fifth anniversary, uh, the one in nineteen eighty nine, oh. after Chrysler bought it. That's the worst of all of them. The anniversary is the worst of all of them. Why? Because the seats aren't as cool. <laughs> no, the seats aren't as, the seats aren't as cool, and it has all the ugly <laughs> strikes on it that they added that are extraneous. It's you know, yeah. it's got side skirts. It's got the modular wheels. Yeah. I know it's like maximum eighty success, but I think that it's one step too far. I think that if you put it side by side with any of these, you know, four hundred S, five thousand S, or you know, five thousand QV, I think it just it. it Pales, and that's so why they're worth less. Does the valuation um, f- department take into consideration the opinions of a hundred and ninety-four year old gentleman? <laughs> In my day, <laughs> well, they, I mean, who does didn't have from a, from well, a bull market perspective? You could say it actually makes a ton of sense because you get something that's in- immensely impactful for less money. They, the twenty-fifth anniversaries cost less than the other mm-hmm. variants because they are uglier, and everyone agrees with the things that I just said. But if you're like, well, I want a Countach at any price, that's kind of the place to start. Is what the I would argue that they're not uglier to everybody because this was the car that they had on their poster wall, so they yeah. coveted it. Yeah, and then yeah, the yeah. other th- that's fair. The other reason, right? They got the once Chrysler started investing money in it, the seats, totally great point. Stylistically, they don't look as right, but they're power seats. You can actually get some comfort in them. It had air conditioning that really worked. They sort mm. of did some of these amenities that I think a lot of people today want out of their classic cars. And this one had them. And then, you know, the point that counteracts what I'm saying is they made a lot of them, right? They yeah. made around 600 of these. This was the most. Well, you all can have them made. at a reduced price. <laughs> <laughs> that's going up. That reduced price that's going right. up. Right. Which is the point of bull market. Okay. All right. I'll allow it. Oh, angry Derek. I is mean, the best. Jay, you, you haven't said boo. What? Who talks? You don't like these cars? I don't have too much experience with them. I drove uh, a CIS injected one and quite liked it. I had heard so much from two valve or four valve. Uh, I think it was a quattro valve. Okay. I think it was four. Um, eh, God, this is so long ago. I had heard so much shit about these cars being terrible to drive. And I absolutely loved it. I had such a fun time. It's a terrible car, but that's yeah. what makes it a great collectible. And it's, it's a just, lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of physical effort to drive one of those cars. But once you get ca- calibrated to that, it's, they're not so bad. No, I, thought it, I wouldn't want to drive one at 10 tenths. There's one of no. those cars where, you know, you're good up to seven. But a car that sounds and looks and feels like that, you don't need to drive a 10 That's right. Exactly. Yeah. It's enough experience. It's kind of just... interesting that the steering doesn't really lighten up with speed. No, it just gets <laughs> heavier. Effort, right? <laughs> just you to know, fuck it's, with it's, you, it gets heavier. But that gives you a sensation <laughs> of stability. Steering and it's still heavy. You're like, so yeah, like if you're 10 tenths and you got to correct fast. No way. Mm, no, no chance. Way. It's just, tough. Oh, no chance. But I'm yeah, right. everything's such high effort. The yes. shifter is like. Just it's the highest effort shifter I can think of. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. But it sounds good. Revs yeah. looks like nothing else on Look the road. At, yeah. and Look these at are it. are probably the most reliable of the bunch, I would think. Mm, mm. Perhaps. I don't know. There's Chrysler a little bought them in what eighty seven. Yes. And they started throwing money at it. And then they started, you know I think they threw most of the money in the general direction of the Diablo. <laughs> True. But this was yeah. good. Okay. I'd have so, a, I just I can't believe the prices. I mean, they are really expensive now. I believe it based on just how impactful it is. Sure. I mean, they, they made mean, a lot of them. That's the only thing. Don't you think all of our peers, right, that are about our age, Gen Xers, and they finally get some money, real money. I mean, this is their dream car. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's for sure. Just, I guess I can understand that. I mean, I just don't hang out with people <laughs> that have any money. <laughs> We're poor trash. <laughs> and all of us. <laughs> I'll have another Volkswagen. And then those scissor doors that inspired all the tuners for years. I mean, Mm -hmm. this is ground zero. It is ground zero. It's ground zero for everything. I mean, it took Mura. Who designed this thing? Was this Gandini? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you can't argue that one. Kind of a little lukewarm on it, though. I see you guys aren't big fans. Well, no, I just don't like the anniversary. The other ones I adore. I'm fine with any of them. 
the more outrageous, the more ridiculous, the better. Totally okay, fine. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to another outrageous car. Okay. Niche. Think niche. Mm. Okay. Think not sold here originally. Mm -hmm. So this one I let squeak through. I was a little bit. You guys can maybe gut check me if on this was a good choice or not. Um, think uh, homologation special. Okay. But not in the way your head just went. Maybe a little different way. Think four wheel drive. I went to Integrale immediately when you said that. Think stubby. Still stubby. Tall. It sounds like stubby. Integrale. It's still tall. Um, like. All kinds of Pajaro. It looks kind of like a JC Whitney catalog special. Like every body add on you could slap on it was slapped on it, but by the factory. This wasn't aftermarket. Okay. It's um, 205 16, turbo 16. That's an obscure it wears car. Where's its spare tire on the outside? Okay. <laughs> so it's. Wow. So it's not the Suzuki Alto Works I was is thinking this, about. Is this the um, Pajaro, so the Mitsubishi? Four-wheel drive, yeah. tall, Yeah, short. the Mitsubishi Pajaro Evo. No? Bingo. Nice yes. guess. Oh, okay. Uh, very good. Okay. I, these cool. things are shockingly expensive. A, a good one's 60 grand. Wow. And it's right-hand drive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally get that. I've but, actually heard a lot of noises coming from like sort of young people who are like, gotta get one of those. I've definitely heard rumblings from the marketplace on those. Yeah, I, yeah I guess in there, you, you, since the um, the twenty five year rule, the importation rules ends. You know, you can go all the way back to nineteen ninety nine. These were built from ninety seven to ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So more and more of them are coming to the yep. country. Yeah. No, I've definitely heard noises just from on the ground about those things. I've never That's driven cool. one. I'm Me interested. Either. I saw one the other day, and I was like, "Oh, that looks pretty cool." I mean, it just it looks the part. You know, it just oh. looks really purposeful, and you know with the. The historical cardinal rules about collectible cars, which is that sedans can't be collectible and trucks can't be collectible, are getting jettisoned by the next generation. That's all. Uh, and yeah. so I think that this fits perfectly into that. Yep. What do you think about these JDM cars with right-hand drive? I know you've got your beat. Mm -hmm. I, I would always, I would never buy a right-hand drive car. But what? that is just going away. Yeah, I would just feel so weird. I, oh, I mean, maybe I love get it. used to it. Yeah, I do. I, I, I wish I the hustled only... the NSX Type R quickly, and that's right-hand drive. Like, I have no issue to hustle a car you like don't. that or okay. use it in the U.S. Um, it, it, if you spent a day in one such car and were just driving it swiftly, you'd get over it. Like, I, I know the place that you are sitting in because I initially felt that way. And then after a day in a car like that, then I got over it. And, like, with, it was with stuff like Skylines or NSX Rs where there's no alternative when you just deal with it. You know, some people I know are even like, I want a right-hand drive car. They want that's to me. make... Uh, uh, they want to make an impact. They want to have a different experience. And exactly, it could be Why more different than like I would if I had, if I had an X series turning three, your wipers on when you want to turn yeah. on. Your, if I wanted a series three Jag XJ6, <laughs> it would be right hand drive. If I could choose my Rover SD1, it would be right hand drive. Oh. A British car should be right hand drive. A Japanese car should. Be right -hand I used drive. to feel that way. I don't feel that way anymore. But I will tolerate really? it for a car that came that where that variant only was available. I mean, if I had to choose between like a, a Lotus Omega and a Vauxhall Carlton, no question I want the Vauxhall. I want oh, really? to drive. Absolutely. Huh. Why not? If you want experience, if that's the whole point of owning a classic car from my perspective is experience, well, go for something completely fucking different. Mm. So I love it. Now, love there is it. for something like this. Maybe you guys have experience with this, but I know somebody here in Michigan who has one and he had it imported from, I want to say Brazil. And it arrived and, you know, basically the, the engine was toast. Didn't yes, and he's got to rebuild it. And you know this this thing had the Mitsubishi three and a half liter V six, but they had four cam heads yep. with variable valve timing and lift system. Usually complex, and I mean just the risk of importing something from another country because what's his recourse? Zero. Yeah. Yes, I it's, mean that happens sometimes it. in the U S. Also, it's the importance of inspecting stuff, and you know people are like, "Hey, I saw you imported, you know, this or that from Europe," and it's just like it's a gamble, and you got to be like, "Well, okay, this car costs this many dollars, and I have to be okay with the idea that I might be throwing away that many dollars." Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, people ask me this question about Integrales also because you know I owned one, and I know a bunch of people who have them, and you know that. People say, like, is it a good car? And they're like, I currently have a GTI or a 911 it's a great and car. whatever. And the question is, like, is this a good car for me? And I'm like, oh, those cars, like, 
you know, I needed a new windshield and it was shared with a regular car, but it was, so it was 120 euros. But by the time that it got here, A, it was six months and B, with the FedEx and duty and all that stuff, it was a thousand dollars for a new windshield, even though it was a 120 euro windshield just because of crating yeah. and transport and all that stuff. And so you have to, I think the Integrale needs to be a seventh or eighth or more car. It can't be a second or third car because the uptime is so low if something goes wrong with any of these cars where parts availability is a struggle. In the U.S., the same thing with yeah, the Citroen. That, that, that's why I initially didn't think these sort of uh, other market cars really should be on the list because they are a little bit unobtainium. But they sort of convinced me that there's enough of these out there. Yeah, and, and there's, there's people who are to the U.S. who are sort of like, well, this is what I want to do. I mean, there's a whole crowd of people who are super into JDM stuff, and they'll be like, oh yes, the Stegia, you got to get that. And Here, like, here's the thing: there's always a community that forms around every one of the cars. So I had that yes. incident where the timing belt jumped on the beat at Monterey Car Week. Um, mm -hmm. I towed it home. I got contacted or I met somebody at a party while at Monterey who said, oh, my buddy just bought a beat in Japan. He lives in San Francisco in the Bay Area, as it turns out, lives um, less than a mile from my house. I talked to him. He's like, yeah, I have the full timing belt kit. Don't have the car yet. If you'd like, just take that and replace it. He gave me a new water pump, new timing belt, new whatever. Yep. And I've no been way. And then another friend of ours just bought one. So now in my immediate circle, I have five friends, six friends with beats. Yes. We stick together. Somebody, if I'm making an order, okay. we share. So it doesn't matter how obscure it is. You well, know, if it's as cheap a, enough or the value proposition is appealing and, uh, you know, mainstream stuff starts to get really expensive, you know, E30 M3s were very expensive for a while. All the stuff that would normally be causing people to sort of get off their chair to buy something, when that stuff gets slips out of reach, then they start to look elsewhere for, you know, mm -hmm. better value for money. And yes, it's a pain in the ass, but, you know, when the ecosystem develops to support it and you're like, well, whatever, this thing only cost X thousand dollars against three X mm -hmm. thousand dollars and I'm having a more interesting experience, you know, and then with Japanese cars, they're fairly robust generally also. Uh, so but even if they're broken, scary. it's your second car, third car, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're not, dri not daily driving it. Some people do, but yeah, most yeah, but that, people are, no, I yeah, wouldn't. The, I I the other cool thing about this car that I really like is that it was a legit motorsports edition. Mm. Yes. Right? The yes. free to car rally back yeah. then was heavily based on street cars. And so you had to make, you had to race what you built. And mm -hmm. so Mitsubishi made 2,500 of these cars. Yeah. So there's not Super a lot of them cool. out there and they had legit motorsport um, heritage and value or use, whatever you want to call it. So it's like that moment in time, sort of like we talk about the E30 M3 made yeah. for the... Anything that person. ran in Group A where they had to build 5,000 or something right. homologated. Mm -hmm. Or thousands instead of 200 like Group B. Yeah, Super I think cool. Great. I think well, it's great. That was a good guess. Okay, we're going back to Italy. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. Um, this is a um, it's sort of, in a way, similar to that GT4 we were talking about before in Utility. Mm -hmm. um, very unexpected car from this manufacturer. Also, like the GT4, a bit controversial with the styling, but it had some genuine, really, really cool technology that um, I was really impressed with to make it more of a all-around vehicle than just a sports car, even though it sort of has that sports car look. Um, huge engine up front. So I was going to say an Alpha feet. SZ, so that's not it. Unexpected, any, any uh, newer than you're thinking, newer yeah, Quattro Forte newer. 5. No, F Ferrari, is it a 612 Scalieri? Close, but even more, a little bit FF further. FF. Took that mission and just went a little farther with it. FF, bingo, there you yeah. go. Okay. So what was that mission, Jay? I mean, you immediately got it when I said that. Yeah, that mission, but further. It what, was what? The, so all I, roundedness. I, I was on the launch of the FF actually, and so I yeah. heard firsthand what the you know the Ferrari people were saying about this. And the idea was to take a car that was truly daily usable, and uh, or to take a Ferrari and make it truly daily usable. And that meant mm -hmm. four seats, a big trunk, uh, sort of livability and luxury features, and four wheel drive. Um, and that was, I thought it was an amazing car. I don't know what you yeah, thought in the, in, absolutely. when it first came out. Where, where were you like on that launch? Were you like, this thing's cool as hell? Or were you like, I mean, I ovulated all over the place from the way it looked, right? I mean, a shooting brake <laughs> is <laughs> goodbye. It's I'm done. Gorgeous. Passed out. Yeah. It's stunning. Yeah. Um, the V12 sounded amazing. The, the four wheel drive system is ingenious. So cool. Ingenious. Yes. Um, and to stop until, it because he knows he, he, he's going to say until our takeoff unit yeah. in the front fails. 10,000 bucks. No, each. it's 30. 
To increase are they failure bucks prone? Each, what, yeah. To do that. Wait, wait, Jay, wait, Jay. Just explain what it is for the audience, because it's. I thought it was so cool. Like, why did anybody else think of this? So this is the, the because it's thirty thousand no, dollars when it should, when it fails. It should not have. It, they should not be unreliable. It's just Italian. So the way Ferrari positions its engine, it's it is completely behind the front wheels. The only way to make a four wheel drive car, and, and it's a transaxle, right at the back. So the only way to make a four wheel drive car out of it would be to do what Nissan did with the GTR, mm-hmm. which is to send the power to the back, back to the transaxle and then send it all the way back forward under the engine past it to the front wheels which requires you to raise the engine up which is why the nissan gtr is the, f- the front end of a ford f-150 um mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. just never going to work for ferrari so what and they two do- drive shafts going down the length of the yep. car basically yes one exactly. to the transmission and then one, one from the, the transmission right. right and so ferrari's solution was put a second transmission on the front of the motor um, Brilliant, and their the way they did it was even more insane because it, it only has transmissions. <laughs> so in one through four, first through third gear in the back transmission, you're in first gear up front, mm-hmm. and then fourth through seventh, you're in second gear in the front, and it dis- decouples at 180 yeah. k or something. Yeah, um, and then becomes rear wheel drive at that point. Brilliant, brilliant, R- brilliant. Something. It's something. <laughs> Uh, it worked. I adore those cars. There's not a lot of modern Ferraris that I like, but that is, you know, there's not a lot of two pedal Ferraris mm-hmm. I genuinely wish to own. There's probably two or three two pedal Ferraris. Look, if that I thing wish had a manual, I I don't want. It is the one of the is probably yeah, it's one of two or three two pedal Ferraris I actually want to own. I wish it sounded more like a 599. Mm, GTO I think it or fine. A, so that's probably it fixable. Fine. You can probably fix that. Yeah, it was the five nine nine GTO went to and there the was quite six loud into one headers startup. Yeah, but then they just didn't scream the way the later V twelve did. But no, spectacular, yeah. spectacular. I'd have it over just for Luso. You know, Ferrari. We know beautiful. They sound great. They're typically fast. The, just the ingenuity in this car mm-hmm. so impressed me. Beyond and all the stuff you guys are talking about, that front power takeoff, but then also something you talk about all the time, Jay, is that packaging. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it has a lot of these four seat cars. The the rear seats are pointless, like a nine eleven. But these things, like you and I, can Genu- fit in the back. Seat oh, of easy, yeah. easy. It's got but a genuinely you, usable back seat, and it's not yeah. a friggin' SUV. That was the right. thing about and it, this. You this look at the proportions. You're like, wait, those those seats got to be tiny. Nope. And it, and it didn't even it, it the doors aren't like twenty feet long. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can open them in a parking lot. I mean, all those details that they really thought about. This was the car that I was like, wow. Yeah. Ferrari really has like awesome engineering. It's I mean, so they really thought annoying that all of the four place Ferraris always got shit on. Always. But they're oh. so often the best. Yeah. Um, yes. You know. This is true of the GT4, the 365 GT4 and yeah. the 400i and the 412. I will not mention the 612 Scaletti. I don't really care for that car. I don't love it's it. It's polarizing. But it's, you know, it's available with a manual. Yes. And 456s are good. appealing that, the, as the, well. The, the 612 is brilliant to drive. I've never. I mean, you can just hammer on those things. Ugh. I've never driven one with a with a stick. That would probably change because I didn't love that generation of F one yeah, automated manual. Yeah, those transmissions. In fact, so that's the other advantage. Of the FF, it, it you know it did no timing from belt, dual clutch, yeah, dual clutch, and no timing belt because the six twelve was Much, the last car with the timing belt, which means expensive so engine out transmission. As you so guys were just stating, the four seat Ferraris. I mean, they depreciate like. I mean, awesome. you lose fifty grand as soon as you drive off the lot. Or more. Lucky. And these are three hundred thousand dollar plus cars that you can now get for a hundred and forty, hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so what our valuation team is 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 their hypothesis is that is that more and more people are gonna want to use cars like this, but also have room for their kids. Mm-hmm. And they want some more practicality. And of course you guys know the Ferrari AC of this era is is awesome. Uh, I mean, yeah. They just work. work as cars. It yes. works. Yeah. yeah. The whole I mean, thing as long as you spend enough money on it, you just gotta, so, you know, spend a big pile of money on it potentially. What is it? You know, because we were talking about this. I was on a, a driving event that I that I hold every year, and there were some uh, Ferrari owners there, and they were all bemoaning the same thing. And it's uh, like we think Ferrari engineered the cars pretty well, but since the dealers don't sell that many, they gotta milk the service appointments. So every time the car goes in, you, it's a twenty thousand dollar bill, whether or not the car really needs it or not. They also I think this car gets lumped into that. They don't like to sit. Um, they work better if they do, they get used sure. regularly, and then that 
power takeoff unit is the really scary part. That's just like, okay, well, here's 30 grand sitting here that goes into the transmission when it fails. I've also heard that the early ones are worse. I think that it's less of an issue on the late ones, like 14 and 15, but on the early ones, like 12s, I think you, it's a genuine concern more often. To, to, to go back to your question, Larry, I think the whole Ferrari service thing is insane and it's all fear. It's insane. It's just fear-based. Like, oh, you have to change your timing belt every two weeks or your car's worthless. <laughs> I mean, totally. you know, I, I've, I talked I to a, a tech who owns a, a Ferrari, vintage Ferrari service shop about the belt. I think it was 11 years old or 12 years old in my 308. And I was, uh, it was done in 2014, November. Okay, so it was eight years old, and that's what it was. And I brought it in and thought, oh, do I really need to do this? And he was like, no. And I'm like, well, hold on. Everyone says, like, it's now, like, down to two years, three years. Or you got to do your belt every couple of years. And I said, how? And he also has a 308 GT4. And I said, how often do you your, do yours? He said, 15, 20 years. <laughs> wow. Like, come I don't on. know if it go that long. But, but then again, you say that, but the one in your beat in a Honda broke. N- well, that was the new one. The old one was 23 years old and looked perfect. So the, the was, new one broke well, due to be, operator be, error. Operator error. We think it was money shifted by. Oh, someone okay. So you don't think it was the, the belt failed? There was a bad belt. Somebody no, over it. Just, it? Yeah, he first, second, and then first. Um, is the uh, how do you do that? That that takes it's right hand drive though. when you're right hand drive and it has oh, narrow and a narrow shift yeah. gate because the whole thing is narrow because it's a tiny car and you're drunk and high, right? And you're driving <laughs> someone's car without permission, but I'm not bitter. <clears throat> I drive better that way. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> You work for a fucking insurance company, Larry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Please. He's I mean, definitely kidding. Joking. I'm totally yeah. kidding. Right. I don't okay. know. I mean, uh, this car is a V12, right? Room for four. You could travel in it. Yeah. It's fast as, I mean, it's 600 and some odd horsepower. Yeah. I mean, and you think about that substitution, like for 140 grand, which you can buy one. And you know, Derek, to your point, nobody drove them, even though they're yep. meant to be daily drivers. So they're, they all have less than 10,000 miles on them. Like what else could you buy today new that touches Aston the Martin performance, Rapide. practicality, experience, design? I don't think there's anything in the market that comes close to it. I would have an Aston Rapide possibly over the over the FF. I'd Although have the FF, the FF mm-hmm. is a wagon. No, FF. But the Rapide mm-hmm. is another one of those ridiculous values. V12, comfortable, yeah. you know. No backseat though. Yeah, it's true. The FF's backseat's bigger, which is funny. Yeah, I mean, it has a backseat, but it's pointless. It's tiny in the Rapide. Yep. What's a fucking V12? So nothing. Have I stumped you guys? There is no substitute no. for this car. No, that's why an FF is one of the few modern cars I lust for. Yeah. I'm there. So, so this gets you ringing endorsement on the bull market. 100%. 100%. Mm-hmm. 100%. I don't care about a $30,000 PTU. Drive I'm it in it. Re- I know. rear drive okay. mode okay. for all I care. Okay, everybody, if you can afford it. Okay, now we're going to go back in a different era, a very popular era for Haggerty clientele. Okay, um, so it's a very the 60s. popular kind of car for Haggerty people. Um, it's American Mustang might not be your thing, but it's so undeniably cool and masculine and muscular. Muscle so, car. um, you're right about the American. It's, um, it, this is, this is a great example. A lot on this list is what we call the, um, what I like to call the substitution. Like all of its peers rose up in value and it sort of pulled up one that may not have been as popular, but mm-hmm. since you can't afford the one you want, you're like, well, what else can I get for that money? That's what happened with FD3 sort of S's. Sort of from that. Well, yeah. That's what happened with FD3 S's because NSX's and Supra's got expensive. So then FD3 S's got dragged up a bit and Z32's. He speaks only in code. It's RX-7. I was sitting RX-7. there like, I should know who that is. You've just shamed me, Derek. <laughs> the, uh, the last generation <laughs> RX-7. Oh, FD RX-7. Okay, yeah, just, okay, okay. We just call it FD. But, Sorry, FD. That's it. I would have known FD. FDS yeah. threw me for a loop. Okay, back to the cars on the bull market list. Uh, condition two. So that's a really, really nice car. Maybe it was just restored a few years ago. It's still only thirty grand, but it has all those classic American traits: big V eight, manual transmission, um, and I don't know. There's so many back in that era. I don't Is know that a big three car, one. or was it made by it's someone three other car. than the big three? Yeah, for sure. Okay, it's a big three car. Because yeah. I was thinking about AMC products. That's what I was thinking too. But X was on last nope. year. It's so a big three. It's a big three. I can read you the quote from our valuation people. They said, young enthusiasts love American muscle as much as their parents do, but generally don't have the cash for the most famous models. That leads to alternatives, including this. And it starts with, an, the model starts with an I. What? 
It's named for an animal. It's not an Impala SS, is it? Yes, it's an Impala okay. SS. There oh, you really? go. But hold on, wait, wait, wait. Cheap. Are you talking like 94 to 96 Impala SS? Or you're talking... No, no, no. Okay, there is... 1965 okay. to 1970 okay. Impala SS. Oh, cool. Okay. that's yeah. Well, that's obviously not a 427. Not at 30 grand. <laughs> no, not at 30 grand. But uh, you could okay. still get... What did they call it? The L70... No, not the L72. You get L36. You get an me. LS1. Oh, you could get an LS1. Yeah, they made 355 horsepower. Huh. So th- these cool. are super neat, usable bruiser kind of cars okay. and simple to work on yeah, cheap to yeah. own yeah i mean the, the this one that we had was black and it looked really menacing but sort of a little bit under the radar but it had all the muscle mm, i mean these are kind okay. of big think of a cars yeah, yeah. i fun. know jay you're like yeah yeah not, no i would totally do car. i i could totally rock it's that. the alternative to my ford galaxy that yeah i so desperately yeah. want it's the same no like, i could genre do of car i love I, I would love a muscle car i just don't have room for one Yes, because it takes yeah, up as much space as two right. conventional cars. Or four beats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but these are like half the price of Chevelle's. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Which it's interesting because cool when they it. were new, there was probably uh, the relationship was inverted. Probably was because it's a bigger car. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm going to move on. This is uh, totally on the up- opposite end of the spectrum in terms of where it, it really wants to be. You know, maybe not on the road. And as you talked about, they used to say trucks and stuff like that are no, or we're not collectible. Well, I think that's been debunked for at least five years. Yes. You know, these SUVs and stuff are not, you know, this is a car that, um, I shouldn't say car, but this is a vehicle that is very, let's say agricultural, very rough, very ready, but it has a certain look that is, is really quite cool. And this version that we've talked about in the bull market, it's on the bull market. It's kind of a little bit of an oddball. It's longer than one ten ones that are Defender one ten, nineteen ninety three. Well, we had a Land Rover on the list last year, so, oh, we, so we tried to you know, spread it out a little bit. But you're not you're you're in you're warm. You're definitely warm. So it's the the Land Cruiser A forty series or sixty series. FJ sixty five? Let's think American. The American version. Of the F Grand Wagon No. Jake, Jake is showing us Jake a picture of a pickup. Is. is it's not a it's it's oh a, a Comanche? Jeep Comanche? No. That's a good guess. It's a good guess, but no, you you, you could seat four in this car. And it's and it's not a Wrangler. And it's a it is a Wrangler. It's a certain it's type a of Wrangler. It's a CJ eight. They called it the Scrambler. Oh, yeah. that, long, that long wheelbase version. Yeah, okay. Man, we were not going to get that. <laughs> yeah, that was it was going to take us six hours to get that one. Sorry. I mean, these are fun. I don't know if you guys have ever driven them. They're they're nope. They're just kind of fun, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no desire to either. No, no. no I, I I mean, like I drive diesel Defenders and stuff. I I get the uh, experience right. If you want to have a vehicular experience, uh, driving something that's really crude is a great way to do that. Fair enough. Especially if you can bring your friends. And get you know what shocks me whenever I get these things? Last year, I think, no, two years ago, we had the Samurai, Suzuki Samurai. <laughs> I love those. I do too. But, and the same with this uh, CJ8 that, that we had out there, you drove it. They are so shockingly stiff. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, it, it's like they put springs in it so you could tow, uh, you know, 10,000 pounds. And I never understood why. <laughs> yeah, stop it from thing. rolling over at a standstill. <laughs> 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 it's got to be something like that. But, uh, you know, all, all the Wranglers, spent. all those vintage SUVs are going up in value. And this one especially, right? The CJ8, the long one, it was the the lowest volume model. It has sort of the most unique body shape of all of them like that. And two-thirds of the people calling about it are Gen X or younger. Mm. It's really coming alive with that generation of people. And But the big thing is um, it, it, it's that substitution thing. Uh, it, it is a little bit more expensive than a CJ7, but... To those cars you mentioned, the Defenders, the uh, FJs, it's still a lot bit cheaper. Mm. So this is a great another model. Like it's a substitution model. Cool. Yeah. And off roaders are just uh, one of the hottest ve- car collector vehicle segments for sure. Well, yeah, and especially because all of them worked for a living, or a lot of them worked for a living, and so they all got used up and returned to the earth because mm-hmm. they were disposable. And as opposed to you know, people are like, why are Volkswagen buses so expensive? It's because none of them survived. Right. Whereas survive, like substantial yeah. portion of any special car, like a you know a, a someone's weekend car, like mm-hmm. a Mercedes SL or a 911 or a you know whatever, 
they all got saved. I also think, um, now, let me see what you guys think of this. I, I have a theory that cars like this are, are gaining in popularity because, number one, they're so easy to work on. And number two, the parts supply is like endless. I mean, you can yeah. get anything for this and you can customize it a million ways. And there's sort of like a fun in your own project. It's like very Lego-like, that kind yes. of thing. People Ex- make it's expressive. It's a form of expression. For sure. Okay. All right, the next one, we're going to go back across the pond. Right. Uh, Jason, you were probably involved or you were in some launch with this car because it had a new engine for the Mark. And uh, like the Lamborghini, it benefited from a big purchaser with deep pockets. Ford. Uh, it used a supercharger. DB7. And it was a heritage car, meaning they borrowed a lot of cues from a successful model from the 60s. But they updated it really well. And um, it's sort of a little bit timeless in its design. And it's sort of, I would say that this car really brought in a design language that, uh, I'm going to give it up, Jaguar and Aston Martin really have leaned Yeah, out it's either the, the DB7 decade. or the XKR. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So really, I'm surprised this that... car is getting recognized. Why? Um, this car always feels like it has occupied a sleepy corner of the market that nobody I know cares about except for one person. <laughs> Was that you or our friend Josh who just bought one and didn't tell his wife? Oh, <laughs> no, actually, it's a, a, d- a different person who's a Jaguar enthusiast. Mm. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I think the value for money that these cars represent, and, and yeah, it was their first V8, although they first came out unsupercharged with the XK8, but I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. those cars are cheap, and they're beautiful, and they feel special and different. Like, 30 grand about gets you, like... 30 is, like, the very top of the market, ah, I think for, like, yeah, 12, the, 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 you can get a 25 pretty... gets you a really, really, really nice one. Yeah. And yeah. you can get a convertible or a coupe. I yeah. tend to like the coupes. I think Definitely. they're Definitely. The convertible execution is poor because of the way the soft top sits when it's folded. Right. It, it sits proud of the body, right? Yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. ideal. Uh, and the later ones, when they went to the 4.2 liter engines and the six-speed transmissions, you can really, like, that's the one to get. It's the late, that's the one that Josh just bought. Mm-hmm. It's the, the last of the cars with the R, they called it the R1 package. You got the BBS modular wheels and the Brembo brakes. That would be the... Recaro seats. With Recaro, yeah, mm-hmm. with Recaro seats and the body kit as a coupe. That's the one to get. I've yeah, never loved... 370 horsepower? Yeah. When right. there were four liters, yeah. And then there were, I think, 400 when they were four liters. Gorgeous. Liters. Jaguar, twenty five grand. Yeah. I mean, price of a new like, what's what do you get for twenty five grand? You get it's for a service, is what you, <laughs> what you, what you get for twenty five thousand bucks. But this was Ford had owned Jaguar for almost a decade by two thousand, right? Mm-hmm. So they I know Jaguar had that reputation, but they're decent. Yeah, they, they're not so bad. They had fixed a lot of the problems, I think, with this car. Yeah, and the early version of that engine had Nicosil liner problems, which everybody in the 90s did, and the cars would lose compression, but they had solved that by then. The, the Yeah, they're, they're reasonably decent. It's certainly less expensive to own than, like, a Ferrari. Totally, and they're half the price of a DB7. Of a Vantage, I mean, it yeah. is one of those, I think it's just, the way we looked at it was, like, there's a lot of value for the money here. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's certainly, like you just said, they're an underappreciated corner of the market but that substitution principle comes in maybe people are looking for a mercedes roadster or bmw roadster and they stumble across this thing and they're like whoa look at all that power and comfort and prestige and all that stuff that i can get for half the price and so we see that sort of hmm. interest starting to percolate interesting i am surprised that anybody cares i assume those cars would be quiet forever like xjs's and just go away yeah, yeah. the xjs seems to be forgotten forever doesn't it yeah well maybe because they made it for so long hmm. okay we're going to go back to the 60s. Uh, this is another big three car. Um, very much astronaut influenced. C3 it, Corvette. Uh, yeah, almost, but not quite. Because um, they gave every uh, of... ap- Apollo astronaut a C3 right. Corvette. You would have seen this in an episode of Mad Men, for sure. I, I actually think the lead character drove one. I won't know it. Okay, four seat convertible. It has a bird on it, <laughs> but not the Firebird. It's in the Thunderbird. 60s. Thunderbird. Yeah. yeah, this is what they call the Flare Bird. It's a 1966 or 64 to 66. Um, oh yeah, just they're super cool. Yeah, I mean, Sequential really clean, taillights. a lot of straight lines. Yeah, it's like a Lincoln content continentalification of a roadster. It's this exactly. clean, elegant mid 60s aesthetic that was very sort of mid century modern and. 
you know, 100%. like I said, mid uh, had the uh, sequential taillights, which is pretty cool. So this is an example of uh, uh, a more prestigious model lifting up the, the less prestigious one. So Lincoln Continental is maybe 80 for a really, really good one. For a These are about 40. Yeah. Right. And so you get, I mean, it's not Continental, but you get a ton of the style, which you said the mid-century modern style. You get V8, you get all the big V8. Really quick. I think you get a 390 in it. You get a 428 in it. Whoa. Damn. You get this really cool, wait to see the photos. This one has a really cool tonneau cover that covers oh, the rear top. Oh, the Speedster thing, yeah. Speedster thing that was dealer supplied. This one, we had the guy had an 8-track tape player in it. Mm. And just these weird pods. You know, they were doing such crazy stuff with interiors yeah, back then. you got then. tilt-away really seats style, like as an option also. Those seats that tilt-away angle seat. towards the door so you can get in and out easier for, for your abundant American frame. Yep. Or your short, totally. short mini skirt. Yes. Okay, so another one that you seem to endorse, uh, the Jaguar, not so sure, but the Thunderbird. I can see the value. I'm just surprised that, I mean, I, I, they're all things I like. I'm just surprised that their values are poised to go anywhere. But like you say, substitution, yeah, so right? You look at what year else Year over buy. year, from, 02 to 20, from 22 to 23, they went up 6%. And so... Uh, How many percent? Um, six. Six percent. So just a, yeah, I mean, it's not huge. But compared to a lot of the other contemporaries, which are maybe going down a little well, bit. Yeah, a lot of things went down is, during that period. That's true. Right. Is meaningful. Yeah. And again, that the Lincoln Continentals are still really strong. So it's sort of lifting the value of this thing too. Hmm. Interesting. And I think that mid-century modern styling is coming back into, what do you say? Would you say in vogue? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, of youths are like, I only pine for, you know, bad tile bathrooms and stuff that were popular in the 60s <laughs> or whatever. Olive green. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this next one, Jay, uh, you're going to have a lot to say about, I suggest. It, it was probably early in your automotive career. Not your kind of car. It was new early in your automotive journalism career. Definitely not your kind of car, but a lot of interesting um, technical bits to it. And also the fact that it was ever produced speaks to the enthusiasm and power of certain executives in the domestic automobile industry, even if we suggest this is a, a, a very strange car and maybe a little misguided, it should have had a V8, but it came with a V6. Prowler. It fit. Prowler. Yeah, <laughs> it should have had a V8. <laughs> I mean, that's literally what they should have put on the ad for the car. Plymouth Prowler should have had a V8. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we both said it at the same time. Yeah. Um, Amazing to Do you look You remember at. this car? Were you? Yep. Is, this came out in '97, and they built them to 2002. I was. You, no, this was, was before. I started in '06. So. Uh, oh, you started in '06. But okay. I did work for Chrysler when this came out. I was in college, um, and uh, oh. we did displays of Chrysler, well, Plymouth, and then um, Dodge products at malls and special events. Um, and we never got a Prowler. We were so upset because we were supposed to get a Prowler when we were at Plymouth. We had a neon and the neon espresso edition and the breeze espresso. espresso. Yeah, oh, that was God. a sport pack. It was so cute. I know, but why I, would you purposely re like enforce the mispronunciation of that word? Because you're American and fuck those Italians. I yes. come on, but uh, the Prowler was always amazing to look at. Um, what a cool looking thing. Yeah, I mean, um, it looks like a concept car that they put into production, yeah. and this was that sort of retro thing that was very much in vogue in the late 90s and early 2000s. And if it had a manual and a V8, it would be worth cubic millions. But it didn't, yeah, Okay, so let's it's talk not. about that for a second, because I don't know if I'm... I, I wonder about that. Like, I understand what you're saying. On one hand, this car is meant to be a modern version of a 32 Ford hot rod, right? Would you say that's true? Okay. Sure, yeah. And, yeah. and I know the V8 was always a staple of that car, especially the flathead, because back when they were building those hot rods, that's what you could get for power, cheap in junkyards mm-hmm. for flathead V8. So they stuck them in it. I would suggest the proportions of this were so important that not having a V8 was not as important as having the proportions and style of this thing right. Was that Tom Gale's story? Was that it was that you know he couldn't they couldn't fit a V8 in there? They couldn't fit it, right. Well, I say redesign the whole fucking car around it. I mean, I, I mean, Tom's amazing. No, like have the engine but, stick out of the car like they did yeah. to 32 Fords. Find okay. a way. I mean, what happens is that it changes who bought the car, right? right? It has to, it is then bought by someone who's okay with it being an automatic and a V6, which means it's not a car enthusiast who's buying the car. It's a person it's a who wants a certain enthusiast. aesthetic. Well, and on the, 
Okay, but on the flip side, right? Who are they? They're, they're certainly trying to hit the boomers. Yeah, aging boomers. Who, boomers who are right. fifty in nineteen in two thousand. Exactly. They wanted something to cruise in. I don't yeah, know. I think the sales I mean, were you, so. You could argue both sides. Yeah. This 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 car was never my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. It looked really strange, and I was like, if you're going to take a flyer on something, you know, do something I, I don't know, a little more sporty. Yeah. But they already done that. They did that with the Viper, which was and also a redo one. of a Ford product. Right, the, the Cobra, yeah, right, exactly. So, I mean, but but the interest in these is is coming back around because wow. they are such weird outliers. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, like they're a like really, really interesting nice and cheap. Thirty-five grand. Yeah, interesting and cheap. Right, anything interesting and cheap, people I mean, are just like, okay, try I mean, to find something with more visual impact than that for thirty-five thousand bucks. Yeah. I mean, it really wouldn't matter if it was powered by a popcorn popper at that point. Yeah. Look at it. Yep. So I can totally see why. I mean, do you remember? Uh, I mean, they. they they stamped aluminum for the body, which is commonplace now, but was like unheard of. Yeah. The first ones had aluminum rear brake rotors. Really? All this to save away. Yeah, they did. Wow. All this I've to save away a V6 automatic. Okay. Yeah. I've never driven one but, either. But Derek, you could you could move that shifter over to another gate and you could <laughs> manually shift it. Oh, t- uh, what you? do they call it? Auto stick or something like that? Tap shift. Yeah, I think it was called auto, auto stick, stick when yeah. in Chrysler yeah. products. Yeah, they renamed it tap shift when it was uh, done the Chrysler. Yeah, auto stick. I just don't know how they got this thing made. You know, exposed suspension yeah. Yeah. in the front. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and it's a production car, 20 inch wheels. Yeah, it should be illegal. And like you look at the little bumpers and stuff, you're like, how does this possibly yeah. pass any US regulation? I mean, yeah. to me, whether we like this car or not, this speaks to me of like a group of people at a car company that had a lot of freedom to really indulge their passion. They had a lot of creativity and engineering power that they could actually make it viable. And for all those reasons, I always admired it, even if it's not my kind of car. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Good. I mean, it's no, it's not a boring product. Yeah. You know, a, commodity a thing. It's, it's an expression of enthusiasm. Yep. Yeah. No, I think it's well, great for that. And they're too cheap. That is it. That's the end of the That's list. The That's whole... all 10 cars. Okay. Wow. Yes. Many, many eras, uh, although all post war. Nothing uh, French. <laughs> nothing of course. French. <laughs> all post war. Uh, well, did, did there pre war come to mind, Derek? Were there any German cars? Yeah, the BMW. Oh, yes. Okay. So you're not calling and there's German no Porsches German. that are undervalued, so that makes That's sense that they shouldn't gonna, be yeah. on there. Uh, well, what about Boxsters and Caymans? Aren't they sort of... I think those cars represent really good value. I would actually counsel yeah. someone to buy a 987S uh, so. for sure. You know, like it's sure. at least $10,000 less than a 997. You know, people ask me this question often. I want to buy an enthusiast car. And I'm like, well, I don't know. For GTI money, you can get a 300 horsepower mid-engine manual six-cylinder car. Yeah. Like that handles and drives beautifully. Like, Very compelling. That's a for me a, a strong one, and you know they got expensive when everything was very expensive, and then they've come down since then. So, you know that's a it's probably because there were people who were on the outer bubble of, you know, second car, and now they're you know, suffering economically and have to unload it. So, yeah, they've come down. You can get one around thirty. I, the, my ultimate value is a Maserati Quattroporte five automatic. Yeah, it's just this, the terror of owning one. Yeah, but who cares? What year is that car, Jay? Oh, oh, 05 was the oh, first five, year, although right. automatics were not available in 05. Right. So automatics were what? Seven? 06 or 07. Um, yeah, until 20. So did that have the 90 degree 20. crank of the Ferrari V8? Mm-hmm. It's a cross plane V8 version of the V8. The entire car was engine. a Ferrari. I mean, Ferrari did the entire thing. Yeah. Um, it shows, it looks at it, it, feels it, it drives it. And it, you know, ultimately reflects in reliability. And the, but and the the rubber, the the uh, interior stickies also yeah. demonstrate that it's a Ferrari. But it drives. Mm. It's the best driving sedan possibly ever. And a friend just bought a seventeen hundred mile car for twenty thousand bucks. Twenty seven hundred mile car. For, I mean, with an automatic. The, yeah. Wow. So I mean, for the price of a new base Honda Fit, you can have a Ferrari sedan. Like this, better make it next year, or like you know. <laughs> well, it just depends just on whether they're up. going go, going up or not, right? They have Ooh, to be. I know, there have to be data to support it, the value going up. You, what you're the, saying is the public should make the value. The, the of these public cars needs go up. to recognize that these this is the most beautiful sedan ever made, and they're fucking. I desperately wanted one when they first came out. And I thought I had a reasonable chance of getting my mother to buy one, but she didn't bite, which is fine because it would have been just it would have been the bur- flappy paddle burning money. Yeah, they're so good. They're yeah, so good. 
I don't. I, have two I think the front that. end of those things is so weird. I'm Headlights surprised were a little to hear small. you say they're gorgeous. I think the Ruth oh. recorder is the best looking of any sure. sedan ever. I think the front is beautiful, but the later cars with the uh, with the, a concave the, grill with the grill, yeah. Mm-hmm. When they did the helped. grill update, the series two, the facelift with the version of that car to me is just like, I think meow. This, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's my <laughs> my vote for next year. So I should go buy one right now. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Go half. Half on a yeah. No. No more cars. No more cars. I'm still I'm still lobbying for the 308 GT4, and I'll do that year after year after year. Hey guys, you know, give me something I can work with here. It's true. I mean, it's already gone up quite a bit. Yeah. So at least there's that. Yeah, I would also yeah. nominate Lancia Fulvia. You would nominate Lancia Fulvia for for everything. Well, here's the deal: against an Alfa Romeo GTV at twice the price, it's like, why does it? You know, I don't know. It's an obscure choice. I get it, and they are going up a little bit in value. You have to be willing to be okay with a front wheel drive old Italian car, but I don't know. I've heard the early ones are built like tanks and really well built. Yes, pre Fiat. Really durable. Is that true? Fiat bought them in 1969. Pre Fiat, yeah. Yeah, it is the highest quality Italian car ever made, probably in by objective standards mm. in terms of like not a high bar. I know. I know. <laughs> um, Those Alphas were durable as hell. I'm kidding. Uh, they're durable, they're durable, but they're not. They don't feel expensive. Um, right. but yeah, th- those are wonderful. Anyway, that that it's maybe too obscure of a choice, but I think they represent good value. Okay. Anyway, thank you for um, giving us the preview. Uh, where can people read more, or consume more about Haggerty Bull Market? Oh, you can get the whole list on uh, haggertycom slash media today, December eleventh, where we've released it. You see all the brilliant photography. You can dive into some of the data, and you can also look at all the past lists. And the track record. And, uh, you know, it's never a perfect prediction, but they're really, I mean, they're over 75% right. Hmm. More often than right okay. wrong. Well, and, you, you can know, print money. Yeah. It could, you know, well, I mean, as you guys talk about, like, I just sold Maybe the Mustang stamp. GT on Haggerty Marketplace for 15250 bucks, And I bought it for eleven five. So it sounds like I won. But, of course, mm. I had 7500 bucks of parts and services in it. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> That's the part that we don't acknowledge or talk about. No, we just talk about the purchase price and the sale price, and it make make it look like this is a really good investment. Yeah, but I had to have the flows. I I had it had to have flow masters. Yeah, well, obviously. Uh, Okay, Larry, thank you. Join us. Thank you for joining us us again. You're going to wind up on the board here, but I'm going to put you in pencil because you didn't actually fly across country to be here. Uh, So you're Mm -hmm. not going to, you know, we're going to get like light gray. Uh, And to everyone else, join us again next week for another episode of the Chrome Engine Show. Uh, That is Larry Webster. That is Derek Tam hyphen Scott, and I am an idiot.